Uh, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Beverly Ann Carter. I am one of the directors of our Confucius Institute here on campus. My colleague, Professor Tang, is also director of the Confucius Institute. And the activity this evening is sponsored by the Confucius Institute at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you, audience. It gives me great pleasure to welcome our colleague, Dr. Che Corbin, who I hear is paying his first visit to the St. Augustine campus. So welcome, Dr. Corbin. <laughs> Dr. Corbin is, you may, not be, you may not hear it in his accent because what you will hear are the Mandarin inflections in his accent. So I need to tell you who Dr. Corbin is. Dr. Corbin is a national of Barbados who studied in China for seven years. Uh, so he had quite a long stay in China, during which time he uh, studied, he pursued degrees both in Chinese language proficiency, but more importantly for you here this evening, he pursued degrees in traditional Chinese medicine, the Nanjing tra Traditional Chinese Medicine University. After his formal uh, degree, uh, postgraduate studies, Dr. Corbin also did internships in China um, at Nanjing City and also at the Mass Clinic, and he followed this up. Now, I am not a Chinese language specialist, and I don't want to barbarize the language, so I am going to be very, I'm going to be very discreet about pronouncing the names, and I will make sure, I will insist that Dr. Corbin, when he comes here, he gives you the correct pronunciation. Suffice it to say that Dr. Corbin is an expert in traditional Chinese medicine, and we know this is something of great interest to people in Trinidad and Tobago, and we thought, my colleague and I, uh, and I should acknowledge the fact that Professor Tang was the one who really spearheaded this project, bringing Dr. Corbin to St. Augustine campus to speak with us. And it's the first time we are ending our Confucius Institute day in this way. Our culminating activity is one which combines the academic side and the cultural side. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Che Corbin, our feature speaker this evening, who is going to talk to us, as his title indicates, about traditional Chinese medicine. Without further ado, I'd like Dr. Che Corbin to come to the podium, and I would like him, please, before he starts his presentation, to give in his authentic Mandarin a little bit about his biography and the places he has studied so that you'd hear the accurate Chinese the accurate Mandarin pronunciation. Dr. Corbin. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for that wonderful introduction, Dr. Carter, um, which is quite accurate, as a matter of fact. Uh, it is true, I have, it's my first time at, uh, at St. Augustine campus, although I've been to Trinidad before, uh, be many years ago before I went to China. Um, why did, I, why did I study traditional Chinese medicine? Um, is for the reason that, as the name suggests, traditional, you're looking at things from long ago. Um, you're looking at things that perhaps are not uh, in our daily lives and philosophies uh, unless you're in special places today. And so, the places where I've studied, uh, Nanjing, Nanjing is uh, the south capital, not Nanjing, you know about Beijing, the Nanjing is the south capital. Uh, interesting thing about this school is that it was the first traditional Chinese medicine university in the world, including China. Things used to be taught differently. Um, but to go on, I come from, uh, my father has a medical background, so many of my uncles have medical backgrounds, and, uh, and growing up, 
I had you know, personal aches and pains and discomforts. And being that all of my uncles and aunties, my father's friends, were, were all doctors, uh, it had really easy access to answers and medicines. But you know, at the end of the day, um, the finer details of, of, um, of existence are not, less, not necessarily known to, uh, to the average doctor. On the, on the other hand, though, I give, uh, I give big respect to especially general practitioners who people ask me very often, oh, what's the di oh Chinese medicine and Western medicine, is it so different? And, and oh, it's, it's such a different thing. And, and, and don't you believe in science and this kind of stuff? At the end of the day, um, depending on one's approach, no matter what medicine you're using, it can be, uh, it can be applied in the philosophy of Chinese medicine, uh, whether it be Western medicine, Ayurveda, or, uh, or even exercise therapy, depending on the, on the way you're applying it. So, I'm not the best at introducing myself. <laughs> so, I shall get right down into it. As the name implies, Chinese medicine has a lot to do with China. Uh, traditional Chinese medicine is the traditional medicine of China. Well, how did it come to, come, to be, come, come to pass, and what does that have to do with us? Uh, in the growing of these uh, medical techniques, the whole world had a part to play. We were all existing on the planet, our ancestors, long before us, and the lifespan of humankind is a lot longer than uh, than science has suggested in the past. Science is now changing the tune to, to uh, the, the history of actual human existence, and it seems to be a lot older than formally, uh, formally acknowledged. And so, living on the planet, human beings tend to find ways, if not to make themselves comfortable, at least to survive. And so, all human beings on the planet are in this struggle to thrive, to feed themselves, to ward off disease, and sometimes to fight the enemy. Therefore, Chinese medicine has its application for all of us. It's not just for Chinese people. You know, sometimes people ask me, well, you're studying this Chinese thing. It can work for, it can work any car. It does work. Oh, if, if I am Chinese, it can still work. At the end of the day, there are more similarities than differences among human beings. Um, and throughout Asia, although Chinese medicine is, uh, it's Chinese medicine is, is, is the popular the term, a popular term, but you can see throughout Asia, Singapore, Vietnam, Korea, Japan, all have the same uh, basis and philosophy behind their traditional medical systems, and behind, perhaps, life in general. If you're studying how to make life better, it's still the study of life itself. Two, how did these techniques and philosophies find their way to China at all? We're talking millions of years here of human evolution, and times when um, the passage of people, like through the Silk Road, for example. People moving around is nothing new to, to the world. And so your ancestors, whether you're Chinese or not, uh, have traveled all around the world, all over the place, and have had discussions among health practitioners and have sold medicines to each other and exchange techniques with each other. But we give great thanks to China because the Chinese people have preserved these techniques for us to re-access today. Really and truly, I would have gone to uh, Africa to study some bush medicine there, but the system just isn't in place. And I give thanks again to the Chinese government for sponsoring me to study in uh, the Nanjing University of Traditional Chinese Medicine, which, as I say, was the first time when traditional medicine practices in China 
had actually been brought together into a university uh, system. Before that, it was the master leads the student. And in some cases, um, they'll, they'll only take one student, <laughs> you know, so things have taken quite a turn. Um, and so people traveled throughout the world exchanging medical techniques and came to exchange often among farmers living amongst nature like uh, people in Chinese history there's talk of almost a mytho mythological doctor called Shen Nong which is almost the um, almost like a, 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 a spirit farmer, or, or, or he, and he's, a, he's almost a, a conglomeration of the wise farmers who knew how to use things around them, and the traditions and health practices that they were able to pass on. This place here, a place called Shen Nongjia, Shen Nongjia, one of the first places I went to uh, on, upon arriving in China, because it has such a history of of being sort of the, the basin of herbal culture there, and also a history of having uh, Yeren, of having um, Sasquatch. So I went on a quest to search. The interesting thing, as I say, about Chinese medicine, and this is what it says in the Yellow Emperor's Canon of Internal Medicine. You can go and buy a, an English copy, no problem. And this book is 2,500 years old at least. And it's a conversation between a doctor and the emperor. 2,500 years old, this is one of the times when uh, the emperor of China decided, okay guys, listen, this medical knowledge that we have here, it needs protecting and preserving, so let us gather it. And a book was produced called The Yellow Emperor's Account of Internal Medicine, and here's what they say. Um, professor, correct me if I'm wrong, Fu Sheng Gu Sheng Ren Zhi Jiao Xia Ye Jie Wei Zhi Xu Xie Zai Feng. It really means that saints and sages of the ancient times have passed down this knowledge so that we may not become sick through weakness and changes in the weather and environment today. So that was 2,500 years ago. And they were talking about passing the knowledge down from the Guren, the knowledge down from the ancestors. And so we're not talking here about um, old medicine and old techniques and old philosophies in terms of uh, 2,000 years ago. We're talking about 2,000 years ago, they began preserving this knowledge because they knew it was going to get lost. Then throughout the ages, we come across other uh, scholars who helped to uh, c solidify and crystallize the concepts and resources in Chinese medicine, like this man, Zhang Zhongjing. Zhang Zhongjing is a very interesting guy because he actually began as an official. We, do we have any officials in the crowd today? Any uh, government? No. Well, perhaps they don't tell, take health seriously enough. When this official uh, was watching painfully his people getting sick and dropping around him. 60% of his village died out. And he said to himself, you know what? Maybe all this um, officialdom and paperwork isn't what we need here. Let me get down to some medical research. And he did. And he has left for us many formulas and techniques which are still relevant today. As a matter of fact, although the book that he, um, the, his main uh, book that he left behind, Shang Han Zha Bin Lun, which basically means um, uh, a, a book on dealing with cold diseases or diseases brought, up, brought on uh, dealing with cold. Uh, this book is still applicable today and funny enough, even applicable to us here in the Caribbean. One of the main sicknesses I come across in my practice are cold diseases in the Caribbean. Isn't that funny? Because we have with us a new type of evil wind. 
the devil called air conditioning. <laughs> and so we plunge ourselves into the depths of winter in our offices and our classrooms. So even here in the Caribbean, I have to wear a jacket. And then we walk from inside and outside and the changes. So I'll get, I'll get more into this and how it's applicable to you today and how you can use his ideas to help your health today. Li Shijin is another one of the leaders of old. Li Shijin is a man who walked the mountains of China trying all kinds of herbs because he had to figure out what they did. These days, perhaps you can pull out some monkeys or some rats and pump them with whatever it is that you want to test and then come to certain conclusions. But um, the pioneers tested on themselves and were not afraid to do so. There's another Chinese medicine which is quite common that he used to cure himself when uh, using medicines which had uh, some s strong effects or side effects that he had to relieve himself of that many of us still use today. And so as we can see, the history has been, the, 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 the knowledge has been preserved there for us, way too much for one person to learn, so part of what I'd like to do today is encourage all of you to learn a bit of Chinese medicine for yourselves. Now, before we get into the philosophy, so that we can start to analyze our own um, predicament experience of being alive, of existing, um, it, is, it is good to take into account that Chinese medicine is something you can experience right now. So I'm, here's, here's, here's how we're going to get into it. No, we, have, we must start from the beginning, the beginning of beginnings. The, the beginning of the beginning is almost nothingness. It is, a, it is a place where it is neither here, it is neither there. There is nothing to be said about it. It is, it is zero, almost. There are no extremes. There, there, is, there, is, there is simply, it is as it is before you start to analyze it. This is the wholeness of a concept. One of the interesting things about Chinese medicine, and we heard a lot about this before, we used to hear about um, holistic medicine. Well, at the end of the day, any medicine approached in, uh, in the with the idea of holistic as a foundation is more or less approached in the Chinese medicine way. And so before we talk about anything else, we have wuji, wuji. And here's what wuji means as a, as a word. We often hear about taiji, but to understand taiji, you have to understand wuji. The whole, the beginning and the end, all together at once, like a black hole almost, from which spouts forth division. And as soon as you have division, you've got taiji. Uh, I hear there is a, a software engineer in the room today. Any software engineers in the room? IT, anyone in IT? The concept of Taiji is almost the same as computer technology. It, as soon as you divide something, then you've got a, a have and a have not. You've got a one and a zero, a zero and a one. It's almost a binary formula. Um, and it is from such that sprouts everything. And as we sprout, give us a little roar in the audience. Come on, let's feel alive here. Roar. Thank you very much. 
<laughs> there we go. Tai Chi, not Tai Chi. All of us know about this Tai Chi, Tai Chi thing. It's not Tai Chi. It's Tai Chi. Tai Chi, the ultimate extreme, the analysis of the ends. Once you get to the end of one, you're back at the beginning of another. The Tai Chi. And to get us going here today, let's get familiar with this thing Tai Chi. Tai Chi, the yin yang, yin yang, the yin and the yang, the opposites of one whole. Like the up and the down. If there were no, no up, can there be a down? So they are one and the same only that they're separated. If there is no left, is there a right? If there is no man, is there a woman? If there's no hard, is there soft? So these are the concepts that we want to start thinking about so that we can start analyzing our existence and our sicknesses and our health today. So let's get down to it. All right, we need some pairs, pairs of people. Grab yourself a pair. And if you're antisocial, just stay by yourself. Um, but get yourself a pair, and let's go at it for a minute. One be the yin, and one be the yang. Who's yin and who's yang? All the yin, put your hand up. Anybody can be yin. Don't forget, within the yang, there is also yin. Within the yin, there is also yang, so you don't have to be female. OK. All right, so good. And go at it for yourselves for a little while. Say one word, the other person say the opposite to it. The opposite, but the completion of the whole. Ready? One, two, three, go! Okay, so what have we got? What have we got? Ladies? You said what? Teeth? Smi oh, smiling is good. So I suppose uh, smile and frown. If, if you don't have one, you can't talk about the other. What about, what about you two? Forget, forget and re remember. If you forgot everything, you couldn't remember to forget. And if you <laughs> what about you two over here? You two good looking young people, yes? Black, Black and maybe white. Yeah, OK, OK, fair enough. Um, what about solid? Did anyone say solid? Okay, so is solid yin or is it yang? It, yes, well, depending on what you're comparing it to. But if it's solid and liquid, which one is the yin and which one is the yang? What about the sky? Is the sky yin or is the sky yang? The sky is very, very yang. So if we think about the sky being very, very yang, as a matter of fact, you see this word tai. Tai yang means the sun because it's almost the most yang thing that we have around us in our existence here. The extremity of yang. So if the sun and the sky are yang, then the earth, the solid, the more solid it gets is what? There you go. Uh, the flesh on our body then is quite solid, isn't it? Compared to our, compared to our spirit. So we have then another case of yin and the yang, which is why in Chinese medicine it's so important to take care of your yang because it's almost like your, your life force. Otherwise you're left with a lifeless blob of yin. <laughs> but of course, without the yin to live within, the yang cannot exist either. Now, the yin and the yang are said to be this, uh, it's to, said to be a balance, but they're not so much a balance as they are a coexistence, constantly moving. And so, for the Chinese medicine analysis, the first thing we have to do is think for ourselves, are we dealing with a yin situation or a yang situation? What's going on, firstly, with my body in general? Am I a yang kind of person or am I a yin kind of person? What 
are we dealing with? Oh, oh now I feel sick, but do I fix, feel sick in a yang way or in a yin way? We have to think about this in order to think about what we're going to do about it. And so, first we look at the yin yang. The same yellow emperor's uh, canon of uh, yellow, uh, uh, yellow emperor's canon of uh, internal medicine has a, a, a line which says, Ren shen you sing, bu li yin yang. Lao she? Traditional Chinese, it means that whatever there is in existence, you cannot get away from the yin and the yang. It can't get away from it. If it is there, it can be divided. And so even this table, for example, it has a yin and a yang. If something is, uh, is three-dimensional, it has a yin and a yang. If it's two-dimensional, it kind of still has a yin and a yang. If it's non-existent, then we're back at wuji. Um, and so, in this time, all of us going into these uh, classrooms filled with air conditioning, it's cold blasting at you. What kind of diseases might you imagine affecting you? Or, never mind diseases, but what kind of state is it that's affecting you? Is it a hot state or a cold state that's affecting you? Air conditioning is pretty cold. If, if we like it, I mean, if we like it how we like it. Now, we like it cold here at the University of the West Indies. I don't know about you guys at St. Augustine, but at Cave Hill, they like it really, really cold. And so um, I appreciate keeping a cool head, but there's a lot that comes along with cold that um, we might not have taken into account before. Two, we're pretty much the, <laughs> the first set of human beings existing under this type of environment of uh, our control. We're all, almost living in refrigerators. How many of our ancestors have done that in the past? How many generations? Not many. And so the diseases that we get from simple air conditioning, just from being pushed in a particular direction, every day, every day, every day in a particular direction, can have a long-lasting effect on you. Um, often people come to me and they talk about hay fever. Oh, everybody's got hay fever. Who has hay fever in here? Not too many. That means that you're eating your curry and you're sweating it out down here in Trinidad. That's the way to go. Because that coldness entering into your body layer upon layer, and then we have the yin and the yang of outside and inside. Inside and outside, which one is, the, which one is yin and which one is yang? Outside is yang, and inside would be yin. And the cold of the air conditioning is being pushed further and further into your body, layer upon layer. And then you step outside for a minute, and it's blazing hot outside, and your pores open. And then you go back inside, and the air blasts onto you again, and it enters into your pores. In Chinese medicine, the pores are known as the ghost gates. And so the wind can enter into your pores, just like we were talking about earlier. This, <laughs> the same wind with the, the, that the yellow emperor's cannon warned about. This same wind is entering into our system and affecting us. And we think it's uh, hay fever in most, most instances, when you really you just have to put a, put a shirt on um, and not let the wind in in the first place. But what if it gets in? Um, how many of you have ever read Isaac Asimov? Good on you. Excellent, excellent. He's one of my favorite authors. And uh, I came across him before I came across Chinese medicine. His concept of predicting uh, the future and predicting situations through numbers is almost the same as Chinese medicine attempts to do through binary calculations. And so, um, as we say in, uh, in Taoist philosophy, yi sheng er, er sheng, si, si sheng wang wu. Um, one gives rise to two, two gives rise to four, four gives rise to 
And from there on, you have a whole world spinning around you. So this is what also um, fortune-telling philosophies are, are based upon. Um, really, it's just a calculation of cycles. And within these cycles, you can almost account for everything. Everything has its place in the yin and the yang. We also get into, then, the five elements. Anybody got a piece of paper? Get your piece of paper out. Very good. Some of you do. Five elements to go with the yin and the yang. And with these five elements, we have the five internal organs, as we call. So the five elements are wood, draw five circles, draw yourselves five circles, bigger, bigger circles. So we've got wood, fire, we've got earth, we've got metal, and we've got water. With wood, we connect the liver. The liver is considered to be of wood. The heart of fire, the spleen. The spleen, uh, the spleen may, many aren't so familiar with, it's almost like the motor attached to the stomach, the part that, that gr sort of processes and grinds things up. Um, the stomach sort of collects things. The lung is considered to be of metal and the kidney of water. And with this same, with the same pattern of the five elements, and things that, uh, th that are reflected on the outside from the five elements, for example, the kidney is reflected into the eye. So put your, draw, write yourself an eye. You can draw an eye in your, in your wood circle there. In your fire circle, put yourself a tongue. The spleen, the earth, put yourself a mouth. The outside of the mouth, not the tongue. The lung on the nose and the kidney, the ears. How does this apply to us? Straight off, have you ever been so tired that your ears start ringing? This is a different kind of tiredness. Those of you who are shaking your heads, good for you. Because when the kidneys get tired, the ears begin to ring. And then you know, OK, maybe I should take care of my kidneys. When you see redness in the eyes, you know your liver has a problem. Also, with the liver, you can write yourself an anger in that circle. With the kidneys, write a fear. With the liver, write an angle. The heart, joy. The spleen is for thinking, not necessarily overthinking, but thinking. The lung is actually for grief. When your lungs are damaged, you feel miserable and depressed. But, you can boost the lungs by boosting the spleen. You can boost the lungs by boosting your spleen. You can take care of your metal by taking care of your earth. This is the philosophy of Chinese medicine. And so, if you are miserable and grievous, how can you overcome it? By thinking about it. If you think about it long enough, you'll realize that, you know what, there's nothing to be so miserable about. <laughs> and you overcome it. And so the five elements balance themselves out. If you are so miserable that, you're, that you're, your misery overcomes your, 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 um, your entirety, then you won't be able to think <laughs> because your, your misery is so strong that it pushes back onto the 
thinking, the metal is so strong it pushes back onto the earth and, and sort of overrides it. Um, kidney is for, th is for fear. So not only do things boost each other, but things also take away from each other. Like, for example, when somebody is absolutely fearful, their kidneys are weak and they're so fearful, one thing you can use to emotionally correct such an imbalance is find your happiness. And your, heart, well, your happiness will start to cancel out your fear because you're, too, you're, too, you're happy enough. And so, and, so it, and so it pushes back onto the water. And there you see again, oh, the heart and the kidney, the yin and the yang, the water and the fire. Uh, and so in Chinese medicine, we balance our out, ourselves out as such. Also, we have the seasons. Because it's, it's, uh, we all think to ourselves, okay, so we want to be healthy. We need to use this and we need to use that. But it's not, and everything might, things are good for you, but it's when to use what. When do you want to use what? And it's even for, even for one person. You're not in the same state all the time. Throughout one day, even. Throughout a year, you'll have so many different states that one particular remedy or one particular herb or one particular food is not going to be suitable for you throughout the entire year. And so, to understand the cycle of the situation, then you can start to apply what you have around you. Anything around you can be used to help you balance out. Now, we go through and this is um, and this is how this is how classification of things in terms of what we eat also how you can use to balance yourself because when you're talking about herbs or methods things take on a different um, things take on a different role things take on a different um, singer, a different essence. And so you can use them to boost different things. For example, and we'll get into that, but let me get back for a minute onto the hot and the cold, the yin and the yang of the situation. Because to talk about the herbs and different methods, we have to have a proper understanding of the yin and the yang. There's another good example that I, I like to use, that you can put to, to use immediately too. Now, how many of you have been to China? One or two of you? All right, excellent. And do you, see, do you notice in China, uh, there are no water coolers? You can't find a water cooler at all in the entire, you, you know, in a university, in an, or you, you, there, there are no water, water coolers. Uh, you know what there are instead? There, there are water heaters. You, you don't even need a kettle. You can walk up to sort of a, a machine that's constantly boiling water and just take your cup and just hot water instantly. Any time of day, hot water available. And that in itself, from the yin and the yang of things, is a medicinal practice. Sometimes it's not so much about the, 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 um, the herb that you're using, but just the physics of the matter. Is it hot or is it cold? And so, all day long, Chinese people who pay attention to their uh, health drink nothing cold, especially women. Why do you think this might be? Yes, it is because, yes, I think tea does taste nice. <laughs> but when I try to introduce tea here, sometimes uh, people are like, well, yeah, that's, that tastes really good, but look, I can't, I can't drink nothing hot. I need to drink something cold because that's what we're accustomed to. Um, glad to see not all of us. But why, why is it that it is good to drink hot? Any ideas? Yes, sir. Gas. That's a good one. That's a good one. So the gas then is also 
not a solid, so it is yang, and so that's going to go upwards. And so when you drink something hot and you put it in your stomach, then it can help to bring enough yang together that it starts to rise like a hot water balloon, like a hot air balloon, and it sends the yang upwards. Good. What else does it do? Hot as opposed to cold. What happens to you if you drink something hot after a meal as opposed to something cold after a meal? The difference is quite big. What happens if we have two glasses of water, same water. We take, some, uh, we take some sugar, let's take sugar. And we pour the same amount of sugar into each bottle. What will happen with the cold bottle and when you stir it? It's not gonna dissolve too well, right? And the hot one, almost, you don't even have to stir it before the sugar even touches the bottom. It has, uh, it has become part of the water. Again, with uh, a nice pot of chicken soup. Who likes chicken soup? And for the vegetarians, who likes coconut oil? <laughs> Good. So what happens when you put that coconut oil in the sun as opposed to the fridge? What happens when you took your wonderful hot chicken soup and you put it in the fridge and the next morning you go to it what does that oil look like? Yes. And so you can imagine then, you've just had yourself a nice meal, and then you get yourself a nice cold beverage, and you pour that down your throat, and then your stomach, which first of all, before even the things in your stomach, your stomach is going to get affected. What happens to your muscles when they get cold? Right. And so what do you think happens to your stomach when it gets cold? It doesn't move too well. It might even catch a cramp. What do you think of stitches? What happens to the food in your stomach when you freeze it now? And you, not only then have you watered it down and diluted it, any chemists in the room, any physicists? All right. What happens when you dilute a solution? Does it react more quickly or does it? And what happens if you cool a solution? <laughs> in most cases, if you want a reaction to happen, you have to warm it up. And so, in the yin, yin and the yang of things, if you want to make something happen, if you want to have your body, if you want your metabolism to pick up, then only by drinking something hot is enough. You can lose weight just by drinking something hot in the yin and yang of things. You can have your stomachs your stomach uh, increases efficiently, efficiency just by drinking something hot. Two, by putting something hot inside you and making yourself sweat, you can push things that were inside outwards, which is basically what we want to do. The whole battle in um, Chinese medicine is fu zhen chu xie, to support the good and expel the bad. So then by heating yourself up, by making yourself sweat, you have yourself a method by which your body can expel that which is within, which we'd like to get out. And so the yin and yang of things alone is enough to pursue a healthier lifestyle. When you're injured, and people ask this all the time, uh, funny enough, some, some people advise that when you have a muscle pain that you should put ice on it. Um, and I, I advise against it. Okay, in the initial incidents, if you just hit yourself, you just, just hit yourself and you're all swollen, okay, fine. You could put some ice on it to stop the swelling so that it won't get any bigger so that blood can still flow through and it will take a little pain away. Okay, fine. But after that, if you're continuing to put ice on it, you're slowing down the reactions and cellular metabolism. You're slowing down the blood flow. You're constricting your veins. And it's not conducive to healing in that sense. 
because the more blood that we can get there, the better. Then the more scarring that can be taken away, the more oxygen, the, the, more, um, the, more, the more fluids can be taken there. And so the yin and yang of things, again, can have a big impact upon you. Um, that alone, but it goes further. So we have then the actual essences of plants, which aren't quite on whether it, it, it is physically hot or cold, but uh, what the essence of the plant is. So we're going to look at a couple examples of, uh, of plants and talk about how you might use them to balance your own state of yin and yang. Now, concerning plants and medicines, um, plants, pl plants and foods are your basic medicine. Uh, even modern medicines, so many are derived from plants that there's no reason to scoff at the matter. Uh, I realize that most of you here are here because you're interested, so any medical, medical sciences in the building? Very good, very good, very good. Don't run from the herbs. And more than that, don't run from your food. In Chinese medicine, there is, there's also a saying, shi yao san fen du, if it is medicine, there are, there is 30% poison. And that's before they even got around to high level processing. Just that stronger, the stronger the medicine, the more out, balance, out of balance you've gotten yourself, then the stronger the medicine you have to use, and there will be side effects. Um, and so the better medicines are food medicine, Foods are, foods are food, it's not going to hurt you. And perhaps even better exercise medicine if done correctly. Um, here's a lady that you may know of in recent times, especially you scientists. Tu Yoyo won the, medical, medic, uh, the Nobel Prize 2015. She's uh, div div extracted a new, new medicine for anti-cancer from Chinese medicine formulas. So there are many clues to modern medicines and new techniques within uh, traditional medicines. And here's a look at something of what uh, your traditional Chinese medicine pharmacy might look like. Each drawer has its herbs in it, and when you go to the hospital, now, traditional Chinese medicine hospitals in this day and age are also rather modern, and they have, they've got all departments. They've got Western medicine operating alongside, but you can still go to your Chinese, you, you get your Chinese medicine along with your Western medicine to push your body in the right direction and assist healing. Sometimes at the end of a, 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 a bout of, if you're really sick and you're on the, and you're on the brink, okay, sometimes you've got to go to your regular doctor. But to catch your balance again, you need to use herbs and weaker things. After you've used your strong herbs, then you get down to your food and calibrate more and more finely so that you're not swinging from side to side anymore. You find your balance. T. One of the most widely used Chinese medicines. One of the, as a matter of fact, tea is the most drunk beverage in the entire world. Tea. Just tea. Tea is also listed in uh, Li Shijin's books and is used throughout the world. How many of you like tea? All right, excellent, excellent. So you, have, you can now, you can get from your tea an idea of the hotness and coldness of things which is not regarding the temperature. So there's red tea and there's green tea and it's the same plant. Did you know that? It's the same plant. Red tea, sort of uh, red tea, as you can see, these leaves, well, you drink tea. If you take it out the packet, you'll see these leaves are dry, they're, from, they're, they are, they're dried down, they're fermented, and that makes a red tea. If you look at green tea, which is the fresher tea, it has a quite uh, different appearance, and just the appearance alone, in terms of yin and yang, how would you put things? 
which one do you think is warming and which one do you think is, is uh, more cooling, even at the same temperature? Just the look of it alone, which one cools you down? So we have a, a sort of perception of these things in our bodies that if we don't ignore it, it, it's, uh, it, it, things become quite obvious and we can balance ourselves before we get sick. The idea with Chinese medicine is to keep yourself not sick. Uh, the better way of practicing medicine, perhaps, any doctor would agree is if you can keep people from getting sick, <laughs> if you, would have, you would have solved the problem before it began. Don't wait until someone's sick and suffering because by then you're so far off, you have to do all kind of extreme methods in order to pull a person back and then there's damages and, you, and, and, it's, and it's gone too far. So that's why we're learning to, to, to uh, keep ourselves in balance through things we use on a daily basis. If you're cold, you might want some red tea. If you have a cold constitution, if your stomach doesn't move fast, if you have a sluggish di digestive system, use some red tea. If you are often finding yourself to be anxious, you're often finding yourself to be uh, hot and bothered, literally, use some green tea. What might you use cinnamon for? And how can we compare cinnamon to tea? Which one is hot? We know this. So the cinnamon can boost your yin or your yang. Cinnamon can boost your, ya your yin. Oh, sorry. Your yang, obviously. Because it's hot, and it makes you hot. The thing about cinnamon, if you use too much in the wrong time, it'll make you so hot that your body starts burning up its own yin. It starts burning up its own waters, and you get dry mouth, and you get bad breath. And your water <laughs> becomes less and less. And then it's, it's okay for a little while, but if you leave it too long, what happens when, a, when you've left the pan on the, you've left your, your pot on the fire, and it's bubbling and bubbling and bubbling, and that's okay until all the water is gone, and then suddenly your pan is going to break. Something's going to happen, and that pan becomes irreparable because it has been burnt. And so that is the situation also with, uh, with uh, even with foods. If your, if your yang energy is suffering, on the other hand, and you're continuing to use cold things, then um, you're going to hurt your yin. And so ginger, ginger is a very good thing. Ginger, yin or yang, hot or cold? Quite obvious. Ginger also one of the well, still used in Chinese medicine today. And if you dry the ginger, it becomes even, even of a hotter nature, an even hotter, hot, more hotter nature. Um, who might want to use these kind of things? After days and days of air conditioning, we all might want to use a bit of ginger to warm ourselves up. Oh, ginger is also known to uh, act against yin poisons, such as that which we find in fish. And so ginger is a common thing. We, we have ginger in our cupboard. We can find it any, day, any time of day, any time of night. Now, in terms of day and night, yin and yang, the day is yang, the night would be yin. Yes? A recommendation concerning cinnamon and ginger and these very yang things. Don't use them at night. Because at, at night, this is your yin time, and if you're using ginger and very hot uh, yang things, you're going to start burning your yin away. Use them in the daytime to promote the cycle of the day. Between the morning and the evening, which is, and which, which is yin and which is yang? Morning, evening, Morning is the rising of the, of the sun. It is the time of the yang. And so the most opportune time to, you, to boost your yang energies is the morning. Use your hot things in the morning to boost your yang energy. Use your ginger in the morning. 
Use your cinnamon in the morning. Make your ginger tea. Drink it hot and sweat. What about mint? Is mint yin or yang? Mint is more towards the yin, it is true, because it's not like ginger. And then we get a sort of understanding of the essence of things. And medicines are pretty much the same, but you might imagine a medicine which is, um, which is cooling is sort of like, sometimes it might be mint on steroids, or mint times 100. So it's not something you'd want to eat every day, but, it, but it, is, it is of the same sort of essence. Mint now is talked about relieving the kidneys, uh, relieving the liver, sorry, and you can use that on a daily basis. Mint is an excellent thing. Mint also has a, a, a fragrance, and this fragrance is attributed to things that rise, things that go upwards, and so it's also good for the lungs. Chin sai, celery. Who likes to eat celery? Celery is good, right? Not all the time, not for everyone. Celery is good for those who are suffering from too much yang, from those who have become too hot inside, for those who are affected by too much heat. For people who are suffering from not enough yang, it's not advisable. Often men uh, and women, for that matter, who are attempting to have offspring or having issues uh, with their functionality are not advised to eat celery at all because too much celery, it will, it will hurt your yang. And when things are rising in the morning like the sun, you may not. So there is a time and a place for everything. Chinese cabbage, one of my favorite. Yin or yang, this is going to heat you up, right? It's going to make you feel hot, yes? No, it's not going to heat you up. It's going to make you cool. This may help for people who have lots of red marks on your nose or your reddish pimples or blotches or you're feeling hot or even if you have a fever and you're actually battling something. Interestingly enough, vegetables in Chinese are called shu sai, shu sai, shu sai, shu sai. It, also mean, it almost means like um, vegetables which, uh, which wash, almost. Almost like washing vegetables. And what do you do with the liver? You wash it. You wash your liver with vegetables, especially green vegetables. Those of you, you look back at your five elements. Those of you who are suffering from anger, easily angered people, you know it yourselves. If you don't know, I'm sure you're your yin or your yang, your other half, may, may advise you. When you are suffering from diseases of the liver or pressure is upon your liver, you'll be an angry person, an irritable person. Almost everybody who I have met who has ever had a stroke is an angry person because they became an angry person before they got the stroke because the disease began just as an off-balance in the body, which could have perhaps been taken care of just by eating a ton of vegetables, but then it went so far that just like the pan with the water, and then the water is no more because it's been bubbling so long, and then you get a disease, then you get a stroke, and that's gone a far away. Most of us have family members. So, also pay attention to yourself. When you find yourself very irritable, you know that your liver is under pressure, eat those green vegetables, don't get angrier and angrier and angrier. Sooner or later, you're gonna be an angry old person and you're gonna get a stroke. What about orange peel? This is a good one. It's almost um, oranges, 
Oranges, you can sort of assess their yin and yangness. Their oranges are actually quite hot. They're actually quite hot in terms of the yin and yang of things. They're not going to cool you down. Although, if you compare an orange to a piece of roast beef, definitely the orange will cool you more than the roast beef. But if you drink red wine, orange, and roast beef, you'll, you've got a, a recipe for heat going on there that your breath will be terrible. <laughs> You can almost imagine it. Mm, don't you just want a cup of orange juice with your roast beef? Or for the vegetarians, let's have a look here. You see, if you're a vegetarian, you're almost more balanced in the first place. You don't have so many things to make you so hot, to throw you off balance. Um, but sometimes, for the vegetarian, you can become too yin, and then sometimes poison is a medicine too. And so here we go. The orange, what do you do with it? You can make a medicine for your stomach, for the spleen in particular, for the stomach. You get your orange, you peel your orange. Make sure you don't buy those American oranges with all that wax on them. Buy your, buy your good local, you, know, you have local oranges, good. And you peel them, and then you, you, can, get a, 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 you can get a needle and thread, put the thread through the, your orange, and hang them up in the sun. Let them dry. It doesn't work if they're, if they're still damp. Let them dry out fully, like this, sort of. That's right. Take the orange skin. Eat the orange and keep the skin. Dry it out and make yourself a cup of delicious orange peel tea. Excellent for your digestion. And what in Chinese medicine, remember our chart? We have the spleen and, the, and thinking. So what is good for the spleen is good for your thinking. Before you have an exam or while you're studying or while you're marking, <laughs> while you're marking your students' uh, <laughs> papers and you have to think so much, perhaps some orange peel tea would be great. I'd love a cup of orange peel tea right now. Um, Orange peel tea, what helps your digestion, helps your thinking. It also works the other way around. So if you think too much, and you think, 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 and you think, you're thinking all day, you've got enough to think about, but then we give ourselves a bunch of rubbish on top of that to think about too, usually. Even if you, even if you have good things to think about, we continue while we think, okay, well, thinking's what we do, so let's carry on thinking. And eventually, you, you hurt your digestion by thinking, overthinking thinking too much. So it works both ways. Both ways it works. Now, question for the audience. What is this popular Chinese medicine? Come on, team. Do I see a hand in the back over there? Yes? No, I didn't really see a hand. <laughs> Yes, pistachio, good guess, but no. Yes, sir. Christmas nuts, no. Unless, ginkgo, no. Sorry? So this Chinese medicine right here, is so popular. It's so popular that this is the premier uh, medicine for relieving constipation, especially in weak people or the elderly, because unlike most, uh, unlike most medicines for relieving digestion, like for example, you might know about senna, right? You know about senna? Um, it's a very cold, cold, cold medicine. It's cold. And so it will hurt you, especially if you're older, you're weak already. If you give this to an old person, you give them senna because they're constipated, and then they're, then they're relieved, but all their energy is gone too. <laughs> Who, who's ever done a cleanse on themselves with some, <laughs> with some, uh, with some herbs, and they, you, you, know, you tell yourself you're going to do a, a nice colon cleanse, and you took some herbs that you got at the, uh, you got at the herbal store, and you tell yourself, well, I need to cleanse, and so I'm going to hit these, I'm going to make it strong. 
and you, you know you've got to stay home that day because it might hit you any time. And by the time you're finished, you're exhausted, <laughs> and you've got to lie down. So you can't do that to old people, and you can't do it long term for people with, with constant uh, digestive problems. So this is the good thing why we have many options in the world around us that we can, uh, we can turn to to heal ourselves. And so this particular uh, common medicine right here, um, suitable for the young and old, and, and, and it sells also in, uh, in pill form, Ah, uh, yes, over there in black. Yes, my dear, what was it? Marijuana, she's brave. The only one who admits to knowing what it is. <laughs> yes, it is marijuana. That is what it is, and it is a common Chinese medicine. As a matter of fact, it is so common that today you buy it like this. It comes in a box, like pills. And so here we are, we can pass this around as a sort of, Chinese medicine has evolved from what it used to be. Chinese medicine is of the past, but does not cling to the past. It is open for evolution. And here in the Caribbean, with our background, we're, we're a ripe place to grow and develop Chinese medicine and improve on our own health culture here in the Caribbean. So let's pass this around. You can, you can take a look at them. You can open the box. Go on. If you want to pop a couple pills, <laughs> you can do so. But to be honest, that's a different formula. I had to bring a different one because if I brought this one, I didn't think I'd get it back. <laughs> yeah, go on. Yeah, go on. Uh, so, vegetables, fruit, they are your medicines if you know how to use them and when. Watermelon. Watermelon, hot or cold? Cold. Yeah, exactly. You've got it already. And it's actually so cold, watermelon, that it can be damaging, although it's a fruit. Especially when? When it's eaten, one, out of season, and two, out of place. So people who have stomach problems should avoid watermelon, should avoid bananas. Because, yes, it's a fruit, it's harmless, right? But you can put so much pressure onto your own system that a fruit also can do you no good. So unlike the hemp seeds earlier, which are warm rather than cold, a person who has uh, constipation, especially a cold constipation, now there are two types of constipation. Let's talk about this a little bit. And I won't ask anyone to put up their hands if they have constipation. <laughs> I'm reasonable. <laughs> but we can talk about this. Listen, there are two types of constipation. One is a hot constipation. One is a cold constipation. The hot constipation is a person who is so hot that their, um, their intestine and their, the contents of which have been brought to such a point of heat that the water has dried from within. The water has dried from within and the reason they're constipated is because it's so dry. It's so dry that it can't move. That is a hot constipation. It's a dry constipation. A dry constipation is a hot constipation. You don't get cold and dry too often. Um, in, that, in that case, bananas are fine. In that case, watermelon is good. If you're too hot, if your stomach has been overheated, you've had too much meat, you've been stressing yourself out too much, you haven't had enough to drink, water-wise, and you've probably had too much alcohol. And people like this are often very, very frustrated. It doesn't just show in their, const in their, in their constipation, but a person who is afflicted with this kind of issue is almost itching, and they can't sit still because they're just so hot, and they can't take it anymore. 
they need a cool down, they need something like, a, like bananas or watermelon. And what's even cooler than the watermelon itself is the watermelon skin. If you can get yourself a watermelon that is not contaminated by pesticides, that you can eat the skin, this is even more cooling. And so you can take care of other issues, sometimes like red rashes on your skin, and all kinds of hot diseases come from just being too hot. The root, of the, the root cause is just from overheat inside your body, not enough liquid. The, and so that's one type of constipation. The other kind of constipation is the type that hemp seeds are good at, which happens quite a lot. It's not the, it's not the hot constipation that you're too cold. This is a cold constipation. It's a constipation that comes about, one, from not having enough energy in your stomach, and then you've hit that with lots of cold water for days and days and months and probably all your life. And then your stomach slows to the point and your intestine slows to the point where it's so cold it can no longer function properly. And so things slow down and the process does not flow, literally. In this case, you want to use something warm and oily to get things moving. Hemp seed is the perfect, perfect thing. So those are the two types of constipation. And the, you can compare that for the hot and the cold. Um, let's talk a little, about, little bit about um, different types of colds. Because we're all going to catch a cold at some point. Now, catching a cold, literally, everything's catching a cold. Um, in Chinese, catching a cold is called gan mao. It doesn't necessarily have the word cold in there. But in English, we just say cold. Everything's a cold. You got a cold. But there are also two different types of colds. And you can, um, you can diagnose yourself uh, by, your, um, by your phlegm. You can look at your phlegm and tell yourself, which kind of cold do I have? And so what should I use? One type of cold, um, almost the, the viral cold that, we, that, that, we, that go around sometimes when the body is weak and you have now caught a, an actual, something has come upon your body, something from the outside has come into your body, and your body is now fighting to, to take this on, and, you, and your body overheats because it's fighting so hard. Then you can use something cooling to help yourself and to rid yourself of a virus. Chinese medicine sometimes is better in terms of uh, antivirus than Western uh, because you can get a handle on the situation and make the environment as such that the, vi the virus can no longer live. And so if you have a hot cold, you'll see yellowish phlegm. You'll see orangish phlegm. If you've got a cold cold, your phlegm is going to be clear. It's going to be bubbly. It's going to be like water. If you have that kind of cold, hit your ginger. And you can get, your, get the cold, literally get the cold out of your body by sweating and relieve yourself from that cold. But you have to use the right thing at the right time. If you're, if you're battling with a hot cold and you go and now you hit a ton of ginger, you may well overheat and it's not going to be conducive to, to helping your body heal. In such a case, then you might want to use cooling things like celery, like Chinese cabbage. And in a formula, in a Chinese medicine formula, to help yourself along, to get the medicine inside of you, why is it a formula? Because it's not one medicine anymore. You put things together. Sometimes you add, for example, you would add uh, orange peel to your formula so that your body can be helped to intake that which is, you have to, it has to come through your stomach. And if your stomach is no good, you can't intake it. And so, especially with thicker, uh, thicker medicines and things that are hard to digest, you would include in a formula medicines which help your stomach to take it in. What about this one? All right. Hot or cold? Bitter, good. And so bitter implies what to hot or cold? Bitter is hot. Is quite cold, yes. Bitter is cold. That which is bitter is usually cold. 
almost all the time. If something is bitter, it's going to cool you. And so, when you have a situation where, you're, where you have too much heat, as we say, in your heart, and you see your nose is red, the tip of your nose is red, the tip of your tongue is red, you're feeling hot, you can hit some of this. Morby. I love Morby. Me too. Morby is a great thing. The thing about Morby um, is that what happens is we put a ton of sugar. And so most of the time, we're no longer drinking uh, sugar-flavored Morby. We're kind of drinking Morby-flavored sugar. And that changes the, by changing the taste of what you're eating, you've also changed the, the, the functionality of that which it is. And so no longer is it a cooling formula, it's, it's, now, uh, it's now something of a, of a sticky and heating formula. Sugar is very, very sticky and heating. Uh, sugar is another one of the devils among us. And I don't know about here in uh, Trinidad, how are things with diabetes? It's pretty bad, right? It's pretty bad. Uh, and it should not be so. Just from just a bit of simple reasoning, it's not really rocket science. Um, in Chinese medicine, there was no diabetes. Nobody used to talk about this thing called diabetes. Tang Niao Bing is, is what it became afterward. Tang Niao Bing. It literally means uh, sugar urine disease. But before that, it was known as xiao ke, xiao ke bing, which means the disease of thirst. Uh, being thirsty is one of the first things you'll notice in a diabetic. But what happens here? Oh my gosh, you're thirsty, you go to the drinks machine, you have a selection between, oh, Mountain Dew, or you can get your Coca-Cola, or you can get your uh, Chubby. <laughs> Sprite, if you want to be healthier, <laughs> right? I want to have it. But could you imagine? How many of you know about the amount of sugar in these things? You get more, if you, you would have to stand, I don't even know if you could put that much sugar in a cup of water. It just would not fit without real processing. You'd have to put about 28 bags, 28 little sacks inside your cup of water to get up to the level of a bottle of Coca-Cola that we figure is an okay drink to be selling here on campus in Barbados and Trinidad. Because when we're thirsty, then we go to the drinks machine, and then we get a big bottle of concentrated sugar. And then you drink that, and you're thirsty again because you've got so much sugar that you can't process it. And of course, which organ processes water? The kidneys. And so you've got all that water in you, and now you've drank your Coke. A little while later, you've got all that sugar. Oh, wait a minute, I'm thirsty again. I better get the Mountain Dew instead so, <laughs> so that I can, I can sort of relieve my thirst. But it's an endless cycle of just poison upon poison upon poison. And at some point, your body shuts down because it, your, your kidney just can't deal with all that anymore. It's like you... It's like the filter on your car, and you can't, I mean, you can change a kidney, but it's way too expensive, and I don't encourage it. Nobody really wants to sell their kidney, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't really want to buy one. So listen, ban off the Coke and ban off the Sprite. I would like to initiate a boycott of those drinks on our campus, so much so that those drinks machines have to change. It is despicable. Sorry to say, get some water, you know what I mean? Drink some tea, right, without sugar. All, this, all these hundreds of years, what has sugar done for most of us here in the Caribbean? Think about that, and we're still on to it. All right, I won't get into that. That's a, that's a topic for another lecture. Um, one of my favorite plants, aloe. Yes, indeed. I was, my, one of my favorite, because barbe, aloe barbadiensis. You know, we have herbal resources down here in the Caribbean that the whole world notices. And so this, uh, the best aloe in the world is, is, uh, is found right here in the Caribbean. 
I'm sure in Trinidad you have the same one. Um, hot or cold? Very good. Very good indeed. So cold that you can use it for burns externally, right? You can do the same thing for, um, for Circe, for, what do you call it again? You call it here in Trinidad, you call this Kareli. We call it Circe in Barbados. In China, it's called Kugua, bitter melon. You can also use this externally for funguses, for rashes on your skin. If you've gotten yourself into a position that you might not have wanted to be in the night before, and you wanted to have a quick fix or some kind of protection from virus, if you've got aloe at hand, you can use that. If you don't have that, here's a quick fix. Toothpaste. Wash yourself with toothpaste. Toothpaste. Because the coldness in the, the mint, that strong mint in the toothpaste will attack and bacteria and virus and restrict it from growing. It's not a foolproof formula. It's just an emergency method what you can grab, I don't advise being irresponsible in the first place. Now, <clears throat> another one of my favorite. That's right. Tamarind, nice and, and sour, right? Well, some, now we're going to buy sweet tamarind. Sweet tamarind don't have the same effect. So much so, in Chinese medicine, uh, when I'm sitting down in the hospital with one of my teachers, and these guys, they know which which medicine from which part of China will have a different effect. Even ginseng, for example. You get Korean ginseng, you get American ginseng, you get Chinese ginseng from North China, you get South Chinese ginseng, and it all has a different effect, but it's the same plant. We have down here in the Caribbean some of the best species for medicine. So the original tamarind that we get in Barbados, I'm sure. I haven't had any tamarind from Trinidad, unfortunately, but they're sour. Sour, 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 sour. And one of the best things you can do for, like, say, for example, sclerosis of the liver. For your liver having too much fat on it. Tamarind. Without sugar. Best thing in the world. So you can do that for yourselves. Also, the leaves... They work too. One of the reasons, I think tamarind is one of the herbs that were brought to the islands from perhaps India back in the day because it's a medicine too. So protect and use. If it's cooling or hot, good question, sir. Tamarind, to my, uh, to my understanding, is kind of in the middle. Some things are in the middle. Also like apples, for example. Uh, they're neither really cooling or hot. They're kind of balanced. Some things are balanced. Um, what else can we think of that is fairly balanced? Even like rice, for example. It's not really hot or cold. It, it's in the middle. Um, sour things act on the liver. They also help the digestion, but they, you can think of it in a, as a matter of physics, even. If you're trying to wash a greasy pan, and you've eaten a whole lot of greasy things, you've had your, what's the greasiest thing? What's the greasiest dish in Barbados? We have things like, you know, oh, Lord. Well, I notice here, you know, what's the big hit on campus? KFC. I can't believe it. And it is... A greasy chicken cooked in grease <laughs> ah, and then washed down with sugar. <laughs> and so what might you what kind of uh, what kind of washing method might you choose for this grease? If it were your if it were your plate in the sink, what would you do? You might even throw some lime in there, right? To break it down a little bit. And so your body is, is similar, is similar. After all that grease, and then you, sugar is also pretty sticky. You know, what are you going to use to wash it, to, to clean it with? What are you going to use to counter it? 
something sour, right? And so there we go. Oh, right on this website, this here, our colleagues at the university, they've, they've put together a list of most of our East, Eastern Caribbean herbs, or take a picture of it with your phone or such. Uh, and you can research, you can start to research for yourself. We're going to crowd research this thing. And we're going to talk to Professor Tung about, um, about perhaps from the Confucius Institute, you know, getting the team together so that we can catalog all of our fruit, herbs, and plants down here in the Caribbean uh, into the uh, Chinese medicine um, classification of things so that we then can use what is around us to balance ourselves and keep ourselves healthy. Build on our health culture. Stop eating KFC. Can't believe it. Boycott, please. All right. Now. Observation, in order to diagnose oneself. To diagnose oneself, Chinese medicine, pretty much like Western medicine, you look at, your, you look at yourself, you look at your patient, you listen to them, you, you ask them questions, you also smell them, you also check out how they're, what is their personality like. In terms of personality, you can tell quite a bit about your state of yin and yang too. Uh, people who are, even when it comes to, um, let's say, people being a bit crazy. There are two types of crazy. One has to know what type of crazy one is so that one can balance oneself out. One type of crazy goes inwards and they don't want to talk and they don't really want to be seen and they curl up and they don't even want to look and they talk in a very quiet voice. That's one type of crazy. The other type of crazy are like manic crazy, and they're excited, and their eyes are big, and they can't let go, and they'll, talk, they'll carry on about anything, and talk, their voice is too loud for the situation, and they just, you can't stop them. Different, <laughs> different types of crazy, which perhaps we all encounter in our personal existence here and there, know how to balance yourself in your yin and yang of doing things too. Sometimes you have to know, do I need to go for a run and, get, and, and invigorate myself? And build, Best way to build your yang energy is going for a run. Best way to cure your yin energy is keeping quiet. Keep quiet. That's why meditation builds your kidneys. You gotta keep quiet. Even the mind, keep, keep quiet. The brain and the kidneys are known as one system. So if you carry on burning your brain, burn, 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 you never keep quiet, is your kidney chi that you're drawing upon, and they will become weak on top of all that sugar. And then too much activities quite often will make them overdrawn and you will get weak, in which case then you have to build on them. The hair is also known as a uh, part of the kidneys. So when the hair goes grayer, when you see people with hair going gray, don't look too closely, then you know that they could take care of themselves a little bit better and that they're on the beginning stages of kidney depletion. Um, you look at the tongue. What about the tongue? Okay, everybody, look at each other's tongues here. Might be a bit personal for you, but those who don't want to keep your tongue in your mouth, fine. Those who are willing to learn with each other, stick your tongue out. And you can tell a lot from your tongue. Both Chinese and Western doctors look at the tongue as a method of diagnosis. If the tongue is purple, what might that suggest? Stagnation. Because the blood is not moving. 
Just like when you have a bruise and the blood isn't returning to the heart, it's looking all purple and bruised, right? Stagnation. If the tongue is all red, if the tongue is red though, you're too hot. Yes. If the tongue is pale and whitish, it might suggest what? Cold, yes. And weakness and lack of blood. Yes, indeed. If you are seeing tooth marks around the edges of the tongue, thinking too much, your spleen is hurt, your digestion is suffering, whether you realize it or not. If you wake up in the morning, look at your tongue, ah, look in the mirror, am I seeing teeth marks around the edges of my tongue? If you're seeing teeth marks around the edges of your tongue, get yourself some ginger tea, some orange peel tea, first thing in the morning, get it down there and so that you can assist your uh, digestive before it causes you further harm. Um, regarding the spleen uh, and obesity, which apparently is a problem in the Caribbean, uh, when you're not processing properly, when, you're, when your system of intake is not working properly, it almost becomes like a car whose um, you don't get them anymore, but the, the, the process which takes in the, 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 takes, in the, takes in the gas, what do you call it, the, the, the k, k, k carburetor, yes, thank you. Yes, the, 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 your carburetor is broken, and so you're, then the engine is not running smoothly and it's producing too, many, too much waste. And then all of that waste becomes more or less fat phlegm, and it stays on the body, and because the body can't process it back off, and then you get to your, your then people get to states whereby they don't eat much, you not know, like, oh, and I don't eat much, I hardly eat a handful, but I just get fat on anything I eat. Your spleen is a problem, and your, your process of intake has become a problem. This often happens after childbirth, and it's a topic for another discussion, but in terms of post-birth, uh, post you, you're just given birth, the process which goes on in China and the process which we do over here is a huge difference in the yin and the yang of things. In China, professor might tell you, well, if you've just had a baby, you are then, if you're following the Chinese medicine way, which most people do, even if they don't really believe it, because they're so afraid of getting fat after childbirth. Uh, because, and because uh, China has a tradition of what to do specifically after childbirth. And what do you do? You, you touch nothing cold, drink nothing cold, eat nothing cold. So that your body can then, the scarring can be removed. And you're, you can go back to normal functionality and recover your figure, and recover your, your form, and, and, re, and your functionality. Big difference, just from a, a small change in lifestyle, uh, lifestyle at a particular point. So the hot and cold of things are, is extremely important. If you want to lose weight now, if you want to get better now, you want to feel more healthy now, stop drinking cold altogether. All together. Back in the day, Chinese medicine used to be taught sort of in the, in a rather one-on-one -on -one environment where the, where the, the student is taken by, is taken by, the, by the, the teacher and they, follow, they, they write the formulas and they follow along. That was school. It's like homeschooling almost back in the day. Um, and the clinic was almost like, a, like the village clinic. Um, these days, though, this is more or less what a Chinese medicine clinic looks like in China. It's just like any other clinic in the hospital. And while you're there, if you need some Western medicine, they're going to give you that too. There should not really be a difference between the two. All right. Some interaction. Listen, guys. Pulse diagnosis. Something rather peculiar 
to Chinese medicine. So we need some pairs again. As a matter of fact, if we have more than pairs, it's even better. And what we're going to do, we have this vein behind the thumb, behind the bone. Come on, everyone. Feel your own wrist. Feel your own wrist. Feel behind the thumb, behind the bone. Feel for your vein. You can feel the pulse on your vein. Can you find it? If you can't find it, then you really are lacking blood. <laughs> or you're tired out. Or you're so cold that the blood can't reach the extremity anymore. This one works too. Good. Right, so we're feeling our pulse here. You might have to press on it a bit. Are you, are you getting in there? Yeah. yeah? Can you feel that? OK, pay attention to that for a little while. Pulse diagnosis. Because you know what? You can tell a lot from a person's face. As a matter of fact, you can tell so much from a person's face. Um, if you look at Chinese medicine diagnosis, that there are many things rather uncomfortable that you can tell about people or yourself by look, just looking at her face. So there's some things I won't share because you'll unfair people. <laughs> like, but if you can tell so much by the face, which is on the surface, how much could you tell about yourself and your, your state at the moment by feeling your vein? You're actually feeling your vein here. Put some more pressure on it. See how your vein responds. Yeah? Do you feel it responding differently? And it's different on the first finger and the last finger? Yes. But line your fingers up. OK, feel the shape of your vein. Is it flat? Is it round? Is it pumping hard? Is it pumping soft? If you push it down hard enough, can you stop it from pumping altogether? Okay. Now that you're familiar with your own vein, feel the vein of the person next to you if they will allow you to. If they won't, then respect their privacy and find someone else. And you can, you can feel your vein, your vein uh, at various points throughout the day and notice the differences. And once you've felt enough veins, then you start to realize when your vein is different and different personalities and different health situations and how, the, how this vein reacts differently so that you can tell things about the body without having to get an x-ray or without having to get a, an ECG or a... One of the things I like best about Chinese medicine is that it's low tech. I was actually going to get into IT, computers, but then I thought to myself, oh shoot, what if the electricity goes off? <laughs> yeah, and you can feel both sides, both veins. Pulse diagnosis. When you are very weak, is it going to be fast or slow? It's actually going to be fast because your pump has to, has to pump blood, but it's not able to do the full pump in one, so it has to do more pumps to get the blood where it has to go. If you have a very fit and healthy heart, it will be slower. It will be slower. If you are an overexcited person and an angry person, could you imagine what an angry pulse might feel like? There you go. And it literally is almost exactly like that. A depressed pulse, it feels depressed. In Chinese medicine, we talk about this pulse, this pulse feeling slippery. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So. If Feel that pulse, get to know this method of diagnosing yourself and others so you can have a better idea of yourself and what state you're in 
so that you can do the right things for yourself. Now, at this point, I'm pleased to announce we're going to get up and we're going to do an exercise, all right? Because I'm, I'm sure, I'm, I mean, if I was sitting down there by now, I'd be a little bit tired. I used to have to get up in class and walk around the back because I can't sit down for so long. So, everybody, make yourselves at home. Stand up. Right, relax yourself a little bit. Ah. Now, we've heard about these things called the meridians. Some of us. All right, we'll do this exercise first. Let's do this first so our brains can reboot. And here is an exercise which not only is good for your meridians, good for your shoulders after long days of work on the computer. Here's what to do. Now, let's first give ourselves a nice little stance here. So we like to stand with our legs approximately shoulder width apart. We like to bend our knees a little bit. We don't like our, our feet point, pointing outwards because we can't then root ourselves. And at the end of the day, the point at which we're meeting the ground is our feet. So there's so much that can be done with your feet. But right now, we just want a solid platform to work with. And then here's what we're going to do. We're going to raise up from the wrist. Inhale, raising from the wrist all the way, right, right in front of the body, inhaling, inhaling, inhaling. Ah, right the way up and then lift up the rib cage. Turn the palm of your hand around so that the back of the palm is facing and then we're going to let it fall until the elbows are at shoulder height. Let the elbows separate. Let the fingers take the lead and pull the arms down so you get that full rotation of the shoulder joint. Mm, here we go again. Inhale. Right the way up. When you've gotten to the top, lift the rib cage up some more. Turn the power of the hands around. Float downwards until the elbows meet the shoulders. Elbows separate. And the fingers pull your arms down. Ah. Here we go again. Yes. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> breathe, breathe naturally, okay. <laughs> Not everybody in practice is the same. Here we go again, inhale. And turning, and twisting, very good. Elbows come to shoulder height, separate. Fingers take the lead and pull the arms downwards. Two more times, here we go. Inhaling. Very, very good, very good, very good. If you want to exhale, exhale now. And go down, very, very good. The stress goes with it. Elbows part the shoulders and the fingers pull the arms down. Here's the next one. Twisting the arms so the little finger takes the lead. Twisting, 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 and inhale. And twisting back the other direction, exhaling, leading with the thumb, twisting the arm, twisting, twisting, twisting. Mmm, here we go again. Twist in the other direction. Let me take my... Here we go. Twist in this direction. Excellent, excellent. Twist in the other direction. Exhale, very good. Rounding the back a little bit. And inhaling. And exhale. Very good. Shake a bit, shake a bit, shake a bit. Now watch this. Here's what we can do. Starting from here, we can go like this. Right down to the fingers. And turn the hand over. And slap the back the way up. And again. Down. On the inside. Up. And down. 
So we're going down on the inside. The inside of the arm is the yin side or the yang side? The yin side, yes. And then we're going back up on the yang side. So in this way, we're invigorating the meridians on our arms. We've got, uh, we, and then what we can do is this. Come on, guys. So. Ah, the bladder meridian begins on the head. When you get a headache, it's usually because you're too toxic. You need to just drink some water and not be dehydrated. And a Coke isn't going to do it for you. So you better buy some water and not no Nestle water either. Get some good water, right? So here we go. And we brush our meridians backwards. Ah, go down the neck. Here we go. And right down the back. If you can, go down the back of the legs, right the way of the feet, and up on the inside of the legs. Ah, there we go. And resting our chi between the belly button and uh, the the uh, and the bone here is what is known as your dantian. The dantian literally is called the field of the elixir. So this is where you store your energy naturally according to Chinese medicine. Right? So let's do that one more time. You ready? Who wants a little bit of space to do this properly? Go on. Make yourself a home. Let's do it. And we're gonna go from top to bottom right the way through one time, alright? Ready? Here we go. Left arm. So by doing so now, we have traversed the meridians and awoken the meridians. We've got 12 meridians, 6 yin and 6 yang. And what are the meridians then? Because this is another side of Chinese medicine. It's another side of Chinese medicine, in some ways more famous even than herbal medicine. And um, the two also meet. And in Chinese medicine, there's also the study of which herbs go for what meridian, uh, which pretty much means for what organ. Now, the meridians on the surface of the body are almost to be considered as the external manifestation of the organ or that part of the body which naturally um, the electrics of the organ must run. Now, I don't, I, I see we have some uh, electrophysicists in the house, so I'm pleased about that. If something has a structure, a body, if it is, if, if it is a three-dimensional object and it has a, an electric charge, it is impossible then for there not to be separation of the charge on the surface of the object. And so that's pretty much what the meridians are, in a way, um, in, on, the, I, 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 on the electromagnetic side of things. Um, there's another, there are, are two more channels which are not considered part of the 12, but perhaps are the most important. And that, those are the channels begins 
on the bottom lip travels down, right the way down the front of the body. Right in front, right the way in front, goes around, goes through the re reproductive organs, and right on the, the lowest point of your torso is where it changes. And then goes up the back. In terms of front and back, which is yin and which is yang? Yes, Professor? <laughs> what about young lady in the back with the lovely dreads? Do you, what, back and front of the body, which is yin and which is yang? Seem to have had some training before, I see. There are Tai Chi monks, the Tai Chi masters among us. Indeed so. The back it would be considered the yang, the front would be considered the yin. Why is it like this? In Chinese medicine, we consider that to be the natural order of things. As a matter of fact, that's pretty much what we're trying to work with. Our position as a human being in the natural order of things. In Chinese medicine, not only are we considered as a body, as a whole, but we're also considered as a whole in terms of the environment. So we talk about Tian Di Ren, the heaven, the earth, and the people. Uh, and so, uh, perhaps this state of yangness of the back came about because while we are working in the, f we like to put our backs to the sun, or it seems to be the natural order of things. Our electrophysicists among us, they can analyze the situation some more. But indeed, a simple way to boost your yang energy is put the sun on your yang body parts. So the sun on your back is going to boost your yang energy. Incidentally, that sun is going to shine right through to your kidneys, and this is a very good thing. Um, and so this, this meridian that goes around the center of the body, number one meridian, do not let the air conditioning blow upon your back. Do not let the air conditioning blow upon your belly. You are harming yourself in unimaginable ways. Um, but this picture, as you can see, so are yin meridians. The long meridian begins right here at the top where we began, and it's the first meridian, so we begin there. We, 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 we invigorate them all the way down. We can figure it right the way back up, and by doing so, now our hands feel a lot better, we feel a lot more, a lot more weight. We've invigorated our, oh, our organs by way of invigorating the meridians. Um, now, this change here that happens in the mouth between the yin and the yang is very important. Now, interestingly enough, here in, uh, in the West, quite often, when we're talking about myself, we're like, oh, me. Yeah, like, oh, myself, me, you know, oh, yeah, me, yeah, me. And, but in, 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 in China, <laughs> they're like me. <laughs> and point, point here, yes. Nobody really knows why. But this is known as renjong, the middle of your person, right here. Right before your meridian changes from yang, because it, it goes around from the back, exchanges right here. This is known as your middle. So in China, even little children, when they're talking about themselves, they're like, me? I didn't do it. <laughs> and the point right here. This same point, middle of a person. If someone has fainted, one of the most powerful acupuncture points, you, this point right here, you take your finger and you push right in and upwards and anybody will wake up from, from having passed out. It's quite painful too. So, take your thumb, right up. <clears throat> Renjong, the middle of a person. Now, because our meridians exchange in our mouth, our teeth, are, the, our teeth and our bones are with the kidneys. So if we want to connect those, two, those, merid, that, those meridians, we need to keep our teeth connected. Mm. Our tongue is with the spleen. If we want to connect those meridians, Put our tongue on the top of your mouth and your lips, put them together because the skin 
is with the lungs. And if you want to connect those mechanics, <laughs> keep the mouth closed when you're practicing your breathing. That's what we do. Now, so there's lots of talk about acupuncture. Everybody wants to know about acupuncture. As a matter of fact, before even uh, considering Chinese medicine at all, most people know about acupuncture, uh, not because it's such a huge part of Chinese medicine, and it is quite a formidable part, but because it's kind of cool, and uh, there are needles involved. So even if you don't like it, it's definitely something to consider. Uh, now, I've brought some needles for you to look at. Now, you're not to stick each other with them, but I'm going to pass this around. So acupuncture, Jinju, Jinju is the method of attaining, achieving balance in the body pretty much by inserting fine needles into oneself or one's patient. Why should that even work? And does it? Before I went to China, quite honestly, I had my doubts. And even while there, I for sure had doubts because I thought to myself, well, maybe they just do it because it's a habit. Right? <laughs> maybe, maybe that's what, just what they do. And so um, that's why I didn't want to study acupuncture by itself. I wanted the full deal, full Chinese medicine. Um, but after... after um, Internships around, around, uh, around Nanjing, Nanjing City Hospital, Nanjing, uh, Jiangsu Provin Provincial Hospital, and many smaller clinics too, and watching what these doctors were doing, and I was like, really? Is that what you're going to do? Because sometimes you don't just put the needle in, you move it around quite vigorously at times. <laughs> Not all the time, don't worry. But apparently it works. And I've seen it working. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, if I didn't believe it by now, I do. Why should it work, though? On one level, your body is being stuck with something. Who would like some acupuncture? Who's willing to, to be stuck? All right. We'll do this. Are you guys really ready? All right. You'll have to sign away your... Uh... Okay, so by this verbal contract, you hereby... Okay, very good. <laughs> so we shall proceed. Uh, I better come to you. There's some acupuncture that's done uh, by putting the needle in the patient, especially with, with uh, movement, people with movement disabilities and things. You put the needle and then ask them to move. Who else would like a needle? <laughs> <All right. laughs> yes, please. Yeah, go, go ahead, sit down. Any aches and pains to be spoken of? Back eight. I can't do that here. We'll, we'll see if we can have a facilities where, where perhaps we can do a treatment or two. Mm, what area of your back pain? Middle back. Okay, let's have your let's have your arm please up just above your elbow. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Very good. Bend it. Here we are. Bam. Next thing you know, what here's what we do. Mm hmm. Bam. Excellent. And this one here takes a little stimulation. She's not feeling anything, so you see it's quite safe. But some people do faint on being punctured. <laughs> so I'm going to take it a little bit easy if you're all right. Um, anybody else who really would like to be punctured? <laughs> being punctured, though, what happens in the body? What happens within the body? 
The thing is, now that you've been punctured, bam, even if you feel nothing, your consciousness on every level cannot escape knowing, oh shoot, I've got something in me. <laughs> even you forget, there's another level of your consciousness that cannot escape, wait a minute, there's something in there, and we've got to do something about it. And so the body gets into action. You're up for a you're up for a puncture? Yeah. Very good, what's up with you today? Not, not, not too short, not too bad. Okay, And you know, recently I've been hearing about this tapping method <laughs> that people have been popular with. You can actually take your finger and just tap the top of your head. Yeah, go ahead. This is a great one to do, especially if you're stressed out, or you've been studying too much, or, or you're not thinking clearly, or you can just tap the top of your head. And that's fine. And it has an effect. You don't have to be too vigorous with yourself. You can take it easy. It's okay. So this point right here, often used for toothache, headache, anything to do with the face. And this point too. Those of you who are not being punctured, also I'd like to teach you about this point. Here you are, pass around this needle. You can pass that around. Please don't uh, swallow it. <laughs> what you can do with this point here. Headache. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Any, any kind of face. If it's your head or your face. This point right here, which incidentally, cut it. It's quite a, if, if you look at anatomy, it's quite on point with a, with a, with, with a, a set of nerves which travels from here right up to the face. And so, you can, you can press that for yourself. There's another one, right? Maybe, let's say, two inches below the wrist, on the front and the back. One is the outside one, one is the inside one. And this point, you can use for car sickness, uh, if you're on a boat and you can't take your seasickness, if you're just feeling nauseous, or uh, what we what also what is used for back in the day in the army, but it's a bit of a uh, vigorous uh, stimulation when you once you puncture, is that uh, the the man who is going to drop down of tiredness, having punctured this spot, can walk for another 20 miles. So, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, I don't know how many, there is Chinese medicine, massage. The thing about massage is that, one, when we, sp when we speak about massage, most people think, I'm going to the spa, and I'm gonna put on some, some music, and they're going to relax me into a deep sleep, and with oils and perfume, and it's going to be a really zen experience. Chinese medicine massage is not this. It is using the, your fingers instead of needles, which actually usually hurts more because you're, get, you're, you're being constantly pressed. Two, people don't like being touched all the time. And back in the day in China, you can't be touching, touching, touching up some other man's wife. So serious to the point where they, even the diagnosis, the, there are stories of attaching a string to the wrist of your patient and feeling the string. Uh, many of my, many of my, um, my, my clients who are practicing Islam they don't like being touched up all the time. The ladies, 
and they, they do not like it. So they're very happy just to come and get some needles, and that's that. Uh, and it actually hurts less. Even people who are, even people who at, at first were afraid of needles, at the end of the day, <laughs> once they've had a five, ten minutes of Chinese medicine massage, they're like, okay, 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 give me the needles, give me the needles. <laughs> okay, listen, I'm going to teach you another very useful point. Very, very useful spot uh, for both, both men and women who are interested in uh, self-rejuvenation. Now, this spot on the inside of your leg, the inside, above the bone, and behind the bone, maybe one quarter of the way up your leg on the inside. And you can take your elbow and you rub it like this. Let me come give an example. Because this here, that is the, that is the spot called San Yin Zhao, the meeting point of the three yin meridian on the leg. Look here, okay? so this is over here. Right? And you can do that yourself. That's how we do it. Uh, here we are. Like so. For, for those who can't see, let me have a volunteer, please. Who will volunteer? Yes, man, come to. Have this strong young man to hold her up in case she falls down. Really? Yes, yeah, because she has to stand on one foot. Right, so, right. So, look. see right here, this leg here. If you can lift it up just a little bit, bam, right, excellent. So you see inside of the foot, bam, you take your elbow on the outer side of the bone, outer side. Take your elbow and rub. If you have kidney issues, very good. If you have kidney issues, you can use this. If you don't, you can still use it so you won't have. Most of us do sooner or later. Anyway. Any questions about that point? I'd like to know that point. Yes, sir? There is a symmetrical shape, I believe, on either leg. Correct, that is correct. You should, you should do it on either leg, uh, on all, both, both legs. Interestingly enough, what you do on one leg will also help the other. So sometimes you may have a, an issue in your right hand. And we say in acupuncture, it means to treat the right to heal the left, and you being zorger to treat the left to heal the right, uh, because in the mind, the reflex is the same. The body will still have that have that reaction. If you're treating one hand, it's gonna it's gonna help the other as well. What's good for one is good for the other. Right. Thank you. Now, Jinju. Very, very interesting word, this word itself. Jinju and acupuncture don't really mean the same thing. There are some things that are difficult to, understand, to explain in English uh, coming from Chinese. And that's why I'm very happy to learn Chinese, because then I, can, then I can access an area of knowledge that I wouldn't be able to access if I was just speaking English. So tired of speaking English. So, Jinju, the Jin is the needle. But what is the Jew? The Jew is actually something entirely different but related. And the two are part of the same method, Jinju. So there's Jinfa, the method of the needle, and there's Jufa, also by itself, the method of the Moxa. Jinju, acupuncture in Chinese, Jinju. So we're going to open this up here so you can have a look at what, what is moxa. Part of the reason why I went to study Chinese medicine is because I didn't get accepted into Hogwarts. <laughs> they wouldn't have me. And so I said, all right, fine, I'm going to China. Here we are. <laughs> hey, thanks, man. <laughs> Respect. And so, here we have 
my two wands of mugwort. This herb inside here is called mugwort, which actually I then cut into finer pieces and place upon my needles and then light them on the needle so the needle gets warm, so that not only do you not have a needle in you, but your needle is warming up. Now the properties of this herb itself too uh, are they're the same, it's the same herb that modern sort of uh, muscle rubs have in them, but in this method, we actually light it. And it burns, and, the, and by burning, it, 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 the, the body takes it, takes it in. It lets off quite, a, quite an oil, and it's rather beneficial. So we're going to pass these around. Along with uh, another type I have, so that you can sort of see what that is. You don't be afraid to, to uh, open it up. Here we are. Right? Check that out. Here we go. Open this. Pass that rope. And so, this, this, this method here, uh, the method of warming things. Now, Interestingly enough, here's a method you can use at home. Something for you to take home with you. When you don't have mugwort, what can you use to heat yourself up in a, speci in a specific point? Many of you ladies have one at home, a hair dryer. You don't have one. Get one, because you can use that on your knees. Right? Not only do you can use it on your knees, you can use it on your back. If you've got a cold cold and you've got a lot of, uh, you've got, you've got uh, clear colored phlegm and it's dripping all over the place and you're feeling cold, like you want to put a shirt on even when it's hot, you get your hair dryer and you blow the back of your neck. This is another acupoint called, basically called the big vertebrae. The biggest vertebrae that sticks out on the back of your neck, Dadre. Also a very yang point. You can blow that with a hairdryer. Your child, if he has a cold, that cold is gonna go quickly. Now, back in the day, uh, before we had such well-made needles, needles, do you see those needles there? Yes, are those needles making their way around? I hope they are. So those needles are so fine. Uh, I mean, modern technology has brought great uh, improvements to, to, to ancient acupuncture. What we also do is we, atta we at attach uh, electricity to the needles so that, like a TENS machine, if you've ever seen a TENS machine in operation, you can attach a similar thing to needles and have it run through the needles. Very, very beneficial for many cases. Um, but back in the day, the first needles to be used were bones. Like, uh, sometimes you can imagine some of, some of those fish bones are nice and small, and you can almost use it as a needle. But it might break inside of you, and that's not going to be fun. Um, we don't get needles breaking in anybody anymore, th thankfully, so don't worry about that. And needles these days are all single use, so we don't worry about that either. Moxibustion. The moxibustion, just as important as acupuncture, sometimes more. There is a particular point in in acupuncture, one or two of them, but a particular point very peculiar to the human body, which in acupuncture we say, you cannot puncture this point, but you can moxa it. You can, you can moxa, you can use the, the mugwort to heat the point up, but you cannot puncture this point. But I see in this day and age, many of my younger female patients, they come and they have menstrual problems and I'd I take one look and oh, they have punctured this point. Where is this point? Any guess? That's right. That is exactly right. The navel. The navel must never be punctured in acupuncture. If you go in for acupuncture and, this, and somebody wants to puncture your navel, you just, put your, you just get up and walk up, because you don't do that. 
but you can mox it. And so also you must not get belly button rings, please. You must not. Part of the other thing, why does acupuncture work also? You mean, one, not only do you have a needle inside of you, but now you've got something going into you which also has something, some of it outside of you. And what would the electrophysicist say to that? It also creates another situation of pluses and minuses and causes different flows in your body's energy. So much so to the point where I was, uh, I was doing acupuncture for a young lady a few years ago. I had just, I had just finished university back in 2012 and I, I went back to Barbados for a year. And a uh, this, this lady came to me for acupuncture. Her thumb was hurting. Her th <laughs> she's, a, she's a painter. Her thumb was hurting. Uh, she's actually a wife, the wife of a friend of mine. So she sits down, I, you know, she, she's a bit sensitive lady, but I know it's gonna be all right. One needle, she sits down, she talks for five minutes and then she starts to faint. <laughs> She started to faint, she fell off the chair, and, and I had to catch her, and, and uh, I should have met, let her lie down in the first place. One of the best, when you know, the best effects for acupuncture is when it, when it puts you to sleep. In Chinese medicine, we call this the, the heart and the kidney meeting together, and this is when your body is in a state of healing. So it's a very good thing to be. Um, so it's not to be feared, it's just, uh, it's just something to be taken a, a, into account. Yeah? Now, indeed, you can imagine how acu uh, acupuncture may have come into being. Do, have you ever had an ache or a pain and you just feel like, oh, I just want to press it? And it's not enough to rub it, you've got to press it and you want to juk it and you want to like, get inside there. Well, pretty much that same idea. And then over the years, have you ever scratched one part of your body and you feel it somewhere else? The same kind of, same kind of reflexes, uh, same kind of idea. Not to mention that, but all along the back, on every single vertebrae, we've got nerves that come out and they go back in to correspond with certain organs. So you can do quite a lot along the back. Um, not to blow my own trumpet, but listen, I got some news yesterday. I'm so happy about this. Let me tell you this story. A friend of mine, like one of my brothers, uh, who practiced, uh, practiced Gong Fu with me. He came to me very distressed and he said, look, my sister needs help. And he said, well, she's not the kind of person who will take care of herself or anything. And she's really stubborn and she doesn't want to do anything. But the doctor says she's about to go on dialysis. And she's not even 30 years old yet. And so he says, okay, look, you've got to take care of my sister. Do what you can for her. So, so I say, all right, bring her along, just bring her along. So her mom brings her, and she comes with her husband, and, um, you know, a good Christian family, and um, not really into anything. And she's like, no, I'm not going to do any needles, I'm not going to do any needles. Whatever you do, just don't give me any needles. I'm like, okay, well, okay fine, 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 fine. Um, but then I, then I gave her some uh, Chinese medicine massage, and she was like, Yo, this hurts. How about those needles? <laughs> and so I managed to get the needles in without her noticing too much. And then she realized, okay, it's not so bad. And then yeah, I said, you know, you know, young lady, you're about to get on dialysis. And you know, that's no fun. If anyone has any family members on dialysis, you know it's no fun. That's really no fun at all. And you really can't get back off it. And she's not even 30 years old yet. And she's, and she's a teacher, and she's stressed out about her class. Anyway, so reluctantly at first, but they continued to come. She continued to come for acupuncture. Her, her mom brought her, her husband brought her. Uh, they didn't think too much about it. They were just like, well, we've got to do something. And the doctors are just, telling, are, are just saying, well, I've got to go on dialysis, and I don't want to do that, so might as well try this thing. You know, at least this guy seems positive. Well, I, I couldn't be over positive because, you know, you don't want to give people false hopes either. But three weeks of acupuncture and a breathing exercises. And she goes back to the hospital. And she called me yesterday at 1 o'clock. And she said, hey, the doctor says I'm getting better and I don't need dialysis anymore. Ha! 
I was like, wow, excellent, very, very good. <laughs> so as crazy as it may seem to stick people with needles, it's pretty crazy to put people on dialysis too, depending on your, on your perspective. Catch it early though, please. Uh, now, fire copping is another method that you might be familiar with. And I like fire copping very much. I use bamboo cups most of the time. Uh, you might know about fire copping from this guy, right? This guy does fire copping. It does leave red marks on you, so people don't like it very much. They're like, oh, it's going to make me red. But what kind of effect does that have? What would you want to do that for? Yes. Prevention, yes, indeed. And also, um, it helps to pull things from the inside to the outside. And once you've got it on the outside, you can get, get rid of it because you've got this suction that pulls and pulls and pulls anything. You're creating a vacuum in a cup by lighting a fire and putting it on the skin, and it sucks everything there is to be sucked. Bringing things to the surface works very well for many conditions. Sorry? You, um, the, there, right, that's a good question. There is a new, new type of suction cup which just doesn't use fire because it's a bit dangerous to use fire these days, uh, but you don't get the heating element. So it, it still sucks, but it doesn't invigorate. It, it, you, you won't get that invigoration, you won't get that heat being infused into the body through the cup, through, through the fire being repeatedly placed on the, on the body. So you don't get that, but you still get suction, which is good, which is good. It's still good. Now, here's another thing you can do for yourself right now. Or you can do for your children or your loved ones. So we have all these acupoints all over the body, but everything in the, every part of the body reflects the whole body at the end of the day. Every part of your hand reflects your body. Your eye also reflects your whole body, your foot. So you hear about this reflexology stuff, yeah? And go ahead, take a shot of that, but you can find these things online. Um, and you can, you can instigate calibration in your body by massaging your feet. Also, you can sort of diagnose yourself by which part of your feet are hurting you most. Now, if nobody wants to touch your feet and you don't want to touch them either, what to do? Go and buy a golf ball. Golf ball, not a tennis ball, a golf ball. Because it's small enough and it's hard enough that you can, you can massage all over the foot and you can relieve your stress, invig invigorate your meridians. It helps, helps your knees too, my dear. Very helpful for the knees. So you can, you can use that straight up, integrate Chinese medicine into your body, into your life today. Now, there are also times of activation, of the cycle of life and the cycle of things. Just as the, in a year there is a cycle of things, the winter time is associated with the kidneys in colder places. You know, there, there are benefits to living in colder places because you get the effects of the season upon your body. In the winter, when things are cold, things get pushed further into the body. And so, you get to boost your kidneys. The body also re reacts quite differently to thick foods and different things. So you can eat thick foods in the winter, no problem. Your body reacts differently. You can, and then, then so the winter is for the kidneys. Then we've got the springtime comes after that. Spring is the time of sp sprouting. In this season of sprouting, this is the season of the liver in the springtime. And so in the springtime, you'll see people, anybody who <laughs> likes to get angry, <laughs> it's easy to get angry. It's almost, there, there, it's almost the season of the liver. And then we go into the summertime, which is the digestive system, uh, the stomach, and then into the longer summer of the intestines. And then we're going back into the autumn, which then you're getting into the lungs, and in cold places you will notice the lungs have, the, the autumn has a particular effect on the, on the lungs because it's so cold and it's so dry that you, you feel every breath, you cannot help it. The same is true for every day. In the cycle of a day, also you get the cycle of your organs. And so, 
As in the morning, as the yang begins and things turn and the stomach activates, these are opportunities not only to heal yourself, but also to hurt yourself. That's why in the morning, if you don't eat breakfast or you eat the wrong kind of breakfast, you can hurt your stomach. If you eat the right kind of breakfast, it's the best time to heal your stomach. At five o'clock in the evening, then, on the other hand, the time of the kidneys, when that comes on, it's the best time to heal the kidneys. Note then that it's also the worst time to heal the kid, to, 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 to hurt the kidneys. Um, on this particular chart, <laughs> on this particular chart, when I was showing this to my, to my mother, <laughs> she says to me, "Look at here, <laughs> from seven to nine, the pericardium, <laughs> socialize, flirt, and have fun." Mom was like, "Oh no, don't tell people that. <laughs> They're going to take it the wrong way." But actually, no, it's not to be taken the wrong way. You can heal yourself or hurt yourself. Um, by having the right kind of fun or the wrong kind of fun at this time. Um, so take that into account, please. Also, if you're tired out, you know what Chinese people do a lot too? They sleep at midday from 11 to 1. Any time in between 11 to 1, take a nap. Why? It's the time of the heart. And when you lie down, it's a lot easier for the heart. That's why we like to lie down when we're tired, because then the heart doesn't have to pump up and down anymore. It's just you're lying down, so things are a lot easier. So when you do that uh, at midday, you give your heart a rest, and you get to heal your heart. So there you are. Simple things that can be applied immediately. Concerning the liver, just go to sleep. The best thing to do with the times. Now. Before we get to this, talk about qi. I'm going to take your needles up. Now, to word, to, 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 I think everybody wants, wants to know about qi. Because uh, we all like Star Wars. And uh, the qi is sort of the force, isn't it? At least that's what, that's what we hear, right? Actually, it's true. And all of us are, you know, even in Chinese they say, oh, eco chi. <laughs> Life is but, a, is but a breath. So this is indeed true. In Chinese medicine, the Yellow Emperor's Canon of Internal Medicine talks about qi shu xue. The qi shoots the blood. If anybody's ever played with a super soaker before, have you ever played with, a, with a, one of those water guns? That's kind of what the chi is like, the pressure. Who has a, who has a, have you got pumps outside your tank, water, water pumps, or water tanks outside your, 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 your house? And on a pump, there's always a compression unit. That is almost what the chi is, along with being almost anything you want it to be. But the breath, and this, this kind of chi, is important. Uh, also here, in the original character for Qi, and it's Qi and not Qi, oh, Qi. Inside this, this, this character for sort of like steam, inside of that we have a character for what? Joshua? We have a character for rice. We have this character in the middle. Because why? There are basically two types of chi that we're dealing with. The first type is your primordial chi. You're born with that chi. You can't escape it. That's what you're born with. That's your constitution. You're born with it. That's, your, that's what you got from your parents, from your ancestors. It's also the where you're born and everything. You're born with it, There's, that's that. After that, primordial chi, which is sort of like your, your foundation, your constitution, after that is your secondary chi, which then is everything else that you intake after you're born. So including everything you eat. So every type of food you're going to eat, is that is the chi that you're taking into your body. All these qigong masters, the guys that like to do lots of meditation, they are obsessed with clean air. They're also obsessed with clean food and the right food. And so we must be careful of the type of chi that we're putting 
into our bodies. KFC is not the best chi, I'm sorry. It's just not the best chi, and we all know that. But um, we can process this chi still. We can get, we can get by, but it's, it's going to come with a, with, a, with a result at some point. You're going to have to deal with toxins that come with it, just the way it is. Um, but so you want to eat good food to give, your, to give your body good energy. And all of that then comes through your digestive system. So this is your root of secondary chi. The other place where it comes is through your nose and your mouth, I guess, if you breathe through your mouth. But you don't want to do that, really. Don't breathe through your mouth. Mm. And so, how do we build our chi in terms of... Uh, in terms of breathing. There's another type of chi, ren chi. Ren chi in Chinese is the chi of people. Just like we have such a wonderful ren chi in this room tonight, because you're all such wonderful people, keep surrounding yourself with wonderful people, and then you'll have good ren chi in your life. It's another type of chi. So, um, from here then, I'd like to teach you all a breathing exercise. Now, in Chinese medicine, up until even as recently as the 1980s, breathing therapy was a lot more popular. Uh, these days, it's a bit less popular because it's so cheap. You kind of don't need anything. And anybody can do it. So it's not good for business. Uh, part of why Chinese medicine is suffering so much is because nobody has the funding for advertising, you know, nobody, but whereas Western medicine will pour millions and billions of dollars into advertising, and it's a, it's a tough competition. How are you going to, how are you going to make money from, from, from teaching someone to eat the right thing, or, or, or from an exercise? You're not going to make any money, unless you're one of these gurus who charge a ton of money to sign up, and then sooner or later nobody will trust you. <laughs> But the fact of the matter is, how long can you go without food? A long time, right? Fine. How long can you go without water? How long can you go without your breath? Yeah, so it's kind of important. And you can bring about a whole ton of change in your body by changing the way you breathe. Also, you'll notice that changes in your body change the way you breathe. So when you get miserable and you check your breathing and you'll notice all of a sudden, wait a minute, I'm hardly even breathing. It's almost as though, it's almost some kind of soft suicide, <laughs> like eating KFC, <laughs> whereby you don't really want to die too quickly, but you want to die slowly. And so you're just going to do the worst thing possible and just take the shortest breath possible and it's sort of denying life. And so then, if you notice when you're happy, you take, you take big gulps of air, your lungs are filling up, and, and, and by doing so, you've, the, your whole body state changes. And so, what we're going to do right here now, we're going to learn a breathing technique uh, that I'll share with you. Um, which is, is actually is rather important, and um, it took a lot of getting. So if you want to pay attention, that's great. Um, now, you can do it sitting or standing. So suit yourself. OK, I see most of you. If you're going to stand, stand now. OK, good. Now. I like to do it standing because then I can do it in the bank, I can do it anywhere I want to, and because I'm sitting all day anyway when, I'm, when, 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 you're, when you're working, what can you do? Now, this breathing exercise, we notice our lungs, the place where we usually use our lungs is all the way up here. And like this upper diaphragm we talk about, but that puts a lot of pressure. It doesn't, it's not the most space in your, in your lungs, and it, doesn't, it puts pressure on your heart. 
We've also got a whole lot more space for our lungs down here that we don't usually pay attention to, but you can expand your lungs in this direction, which then not only gives you air, but it massages your organs from the inside in a way that you could not do otherwise. And so then you get movement of blood and you get, uh, you get stagnation taken away in dramatically. And so this is how we do it. This is how we practice. First, let us first take our hands and put our hands on our belly. Because then you can feel your belly a little bit better. The principle of it, and let's have a good stance again like we did just now. Because if we're gonna, if we're gonna breathe into our torso, we want to have our torso in the right place. If you've got your torso all bent up, you're not going to have space to put your body. So we want to curl our hip forward rather than backwards. Right? You got that idea? And then, the principle of the breath is the longer, the slower, the smoother, the better. As a matter of fact, you do not even want to hear your breath. So when you go to yoga classes and everybody's... <sighs> <sighs> No, that's not the way. You don't want to hear the breath. And then you're taking it in so slowly and smoothly, your nose feels it. And your nose feeling it is the indication that your body is prepared to use it. So feel the breath on your nose and let your lungs fill up slowly and smoothly. And let your breath enter into your abdomen. Make your belly big so. <laughs> right? Before exhaling again. So we want to inhale, fill your abdomen. Exhale. Practice for a bit. Put your attention there too. Feel that breath coming through your nose. Fill the lowest part of your abdomen that you can first and work upwards from there. You can feel your organs being squeezed by your breath. Don't be embarrassed, make it better day. I've seen people who can't keep it up, don't stop now. I've seen people who could not have babies practice for two months and have twins. You can put your hands over your navel, it's also good. Inhaling. And exhaling, I'll show you mine again. Exhaling. Keep it up by doing so. Good. By doing so, you're massaging your innards in a way that only you can. You're taking in more breath than you could before. You can do this exercise sitting down in a classroom, standing on a bus, standing in the bank, And by doing this exercise, you can shoot your blood further, you can feed your brain better, you can nourish your kidneys, and you can relax yourself. Give yourself a nice, good five breath. Put your intention on your breath. Put your intention on the same dantian of your lower stomach, of your lower abdomen that we were talking about. Because in Chinese medicine we say, Yi dao qi dao, 
Where the intention goes, the qi follows. Qi dao xue dao. Where the qi goes, the blood follows. So, your mind is very powerful. Think to yourself that you're filling yourself with energy. Fill your stomach with that energy. And let that energy push out any negative energy that you might have had stuck there because you didn't have enough good energy to push it out. Practice hard. Thank you for coming, everyone. It's, it's been a pleasure being here. Thank you very much, Professor Tang. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for practicing and taking care of yourselves. And uh, let us together build and strengthen the health culture of the Caribbean. <laughs>